When one of the biggest banks in the world says it has spotted a company to buy, the finance world pays attention. Back in September 2021, JP Morgan paid the whopping sum of $175 million for the purchase of a small, very unknown company called Frank. The business, ran by a young and ambitious woman named Charlie Javis, was regarded as an opportunity to diversify JP Morgan's reach by accessing various colleges and educational institutions. Frank, as simple as a name it is, was a college financial planning company. At the time of purchase, Javis stated their service was being used by over 6,000 colleges across the country and 5 million students. It took over a year for JP Morgan to notice something significantly worrying. The company they had bought seemed to not have the reach and amount of clients they had been told. The bank then presented Javis with a lawsuit stating that she had forged the list of clients and produced a scheme to fluff up the amount so it legitimately looked like they had 5 million customers. According to JP Morgan, Javis went all the way when it came to lying about the company's market reach, success, and even size. The way Frank was able to present the image of a highly profitable investment was through the forgery of its numbers. The company's chief growth and acquisition officer, Olivier Amar, was accused of hiring a data science professor to sketch out a plan for JP Morgan's team to see real data that would indicate Frank was a solid investment. Having struggled herself to make payments for her own college education, Javis had a strong motivation to create Frank. The stress of having to get financial aid to go to college was grueling. Back in 2016, when she started the company, Javis was seen by many as a knowledgeable woman when it came to the media with enough first-hand experience in the financial aid sector. Her personal story seemed to lure a lot of investors her way. Javis had become notorious for knowing how to tell her story in a way that would compel several angel investors to believe in her business plan. On one occasion, she stated the devastating story of how her mother would cry when visiting a financial aid office to get money to pay for her daughter's tuition fees. Javis's interest in lending a hand apparently struck her when she spent a summer volunteering in Southeast Asia. It was that experience that inspired her to create her first endeavor, Pover Up. The idea behind Pover Up was to create a platform that would teach students how to reduce the poverty gap through business. According to her, the project had 50 schools joining their network every month. While studying at the University of Pennsylvania, Javis said she had major problems while applying for financial aid. The forms were very confusing to her. Her issues with the forms were discussed in a couple of interviews in which she stated that even her parents, who both had master's degrees, were confused by the forms too. She also said that her appeals for financial aid would take an entire semester, something very uncommon at the university. They would take a maximum of six weeks. Her family seemed to have a strong financial background, with her father, Didier Javis, having worked on Wall Street for 35 years. This is where questions about her need to apply for financial aid seemed to center around. And while the Wharton School, where Javis claimed she earned her master's, couldn't confirm she actually had more than a bachelor's degree, there isn't any public information about the existence of her financial aid. In 2013, Javis registered her first company, TAPD, TAPT. The company would have served as a way to help people who are getting started in life to get more considerate credit scores. And while her intentions were noble, she realized after a year and a half that understanding the complex laws and regulations that control credit scoring were virtually impossible to maintain through her small company. So she fired everyone. According to her, to this day, many of her former employees employees won't talk to her. In 2016, Javis started promoting a website named frankbafsa.com. In it, the company promised a money-back guarantee scheme for students applying for financial aid who didn't receive at least $1,000 off their tuition. Turns out, the Department of Education took notice of the website and quickly took legal action. FAFSA, which stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid, is a registered trademark of the U.S. Department of Education. Javis agreed to relinquish the website to them. Any mention of FAFSA would have to be removed from that 
that moment on. So Frank became its sole name, something that didn't please Adi Amsi, Frank's then chief technical officer and co-founder, who sued Javis and got a settlement. While all of this was happening, Javis was receiving a lot of media attention. One time, she even wrote an opinion piece for the New York Times about FAFSA that turned out to be so full of errors, the newspaper had to issue an eight-sentence correction. But this didn't stop her role. She had multiple interviews in highly notorious media outlets despite there being numerous red flags regarding her business handlings. An in-depth interview about her startup at Yahoo was the beginning of a whole media tour that reached its peak with Javis appearing in Forbes 30 Under 30 list. Unfortunately for Javis, it didn't take long for detractors to appear. Wesley Whistle, a man from the New America Think Tank, wrote an infamous blog post where he denounced Frank's lack of credibility for promising help with pandemic reliefs with schools and colleges it wasn't working with directly. Soon after, Frank received a warning letter from the Federal Trade Commission stating their worries about the so-called assistance they provided, which was lacking vital information for students who were actually applying to universities. Part of Frank's offer included not only assistance in financial aid, but a ton of online classes available to registered students who had paid one of their monthly or yearly plans. Classes, ranging from $500 to $700, were said to be part of the curriculum of several universities. One of them was supposed to be Kaiser University, which had 448 courses available within Frank's website. Kaiser University had no clue about it. In fact, the university said they had no knowledge of Frank or contracts whatsoever. Another school in Cleveland, Lee University, was said to offer 317 classes through Frank's online system. Funny enough, Lee only had 248 online courses available, and of course, no one that worked there had even heard of Frank. In a statement, Lee University denied any connection to Frank and their class subscription system. While there seemed to be a long line of schools doing business with the company, there was a lot of disbelief. Even during investing pitches, Frank wasn't able to publicly state which schools were doing business with them, something that raised eyebrows for many financial investors. Needless to say, it was a true surprise to many financial advisors when, in September 2021, JP Morgan announced it was acquiring Frank. Experts were in disbelief. What was really worrying was how Frank's numbers didn't add up. The amount of customers the platform had was disproportionate to the amount of teenagers entering colleges in the US. And even if many of them received help during their FAFSA, it still didn't make 5 million people in 5 years. An independent survey done by Mark Salisbury from Augustana College stated how impossible it would be for a small company like that to reach those numbers without a heavy financial investment of millions of dollars. He knew there was something fishy. Even the website traffic wouldn't have been able to reach the numbers Javis was claiming. A survey done by Krantowitz, who had filed the Freedom of Information Act a few years prior, showed it only reached 67,000 a month. Added to this, there was the claim that Frank was working with students in about 6,000 different schools across the U.S. Official data from the government states there are only 5,916 institutions that qualify for financial aid. For Frank to reach those numbers, not only would they have had to round them out, but they would have had to work with each and every single one of those colleges. Highly unlikely. There's still a lot to be understood as to why JP Morgan had such an interest in Frank. They even went as far as proposing a $20 million upfront payment as a retention fee so that Javis would stay during JP's merger. Not only that, they were in it for the long run. JP Morgan's intention was to be able to work with all 5 million customers through Frank for many decades to come. The startup would serve as a database and direct link between the bank and the young demographic they were working with. So, after settling a $35 per person fee, JP Morgan would be paying an astounding $175 million in total for the purchase of Frank. Once the contracts were signed and the deal was set, JP Morgan started its way towards connecting with the client database. Of the 400,000 emails that were sent, only 28% were received in a functional inbox. Weird, considering Frank claimed to have a 99% delivery success with its customers. From the thousands of emails sent, only one 103 customers actually clicked the link Frank had provided. Soon after, it was clear to JP Morgan that Frank didn't have more than a mere 250,000 clients. And an in-depth investigation started by taking a dive into Frank's email account. In the midst of many incriminating messages, JP Morgan found evidence that Javis had hired a data scientist to fake data so that the bank would see there were millions of customers, which was, in fact, a lie. The situation was concerning, to say the least. Another email conversation with one of Frank's 
Frank's engineers, had Javis saying there shouldn't be any worry about the faking of the numbers because she believed nobody would go to jail for it. When presented with a formal lawsuit from JP Morgan, Javis then sided with Alex Spiro, a defense attorney known for being part of Elon Musk's team in another lawsuit. Javis claims JP Morgan should pay her for the internal investigation, citing she requires her legal expenses to be covered by the bank, according to the contract. Her attorney claims JP Morgan had tried to access private information from students, and when they realized they would be breaking the law and could be open to litigation, they used this lawsuit as a cover-up. Added to this, Spiro also commented that the allegations of data manipulation against Javis were false. According to him, JP Morgan received all of the information before the purchase and were fully aware of the student privacy laws that would forbid them from accessing certain data. The data forgery claims were just a way to back off from the deal. Federal laws protect certain student data from being accessed by institutions and colleges. While this may be true for them, it was unclear if a company like Frank, which did not directly work with the information, would fall under the federal law's protection. JP Morgan shut down Frank and even deleted the purchase from their website. It's safe to say the bank considered the whole ordeal a catastrophe. And while the bank has been clear on recognizing the huge mistake they made, questions have arised about whether or not they did proper research on the matter before buying a startup like Frank. There's no knowledge of people who actually used financial aid being involved in the research or if any of the bank's executives actually knew how a FAFSA worked. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to stay tuned to learn about how this African playboy is wasting his country's money. Frank's journey through the world of financial aid may be over, but that hasn't stopped other similar companies from having hope. Unfortunately, the way to help more students with their debt seems to be way trickier now, since a lot of these companies need banks and venture capital firms to help them finance their operations and reach more students. And they aren't all willing to do it. Frank's disaster seems to be the primary reference nowadays, as if these companies weren't struggling already. The way Javis built her company will forever generate doubts for anyone who was involved in the process. As the media has reported, there isn't even a way to confirm that her business references or mentors are even connected with her. None of the investors she had named would confirm anything. In fact, one of her mentors, whom she credited to have been the person that helped her out the most when she was struggling with her startup, Bobby Turner, publicly stated he didn't directly give her any advice. He was just a benefactor at Warden who was in contact with a lot of students, not her personal mentor. Who knows what's next for the drama that Javis v. JP Morgan, as the case is currently ongoing. Regardless of the outcome, Frank is a prime example of buyer beware. Just because the claims of a product seem credible doesn't mean they actually are. Due diligence is always necessary. Only seeing the potential of a thing without also looking at the reality of a thing will only set you up to fail. That's just us being Frank. Love him or hate him, it's clear that former U.S. President Donald Trump rewrote the rules regarding how a commander-in-chief should behave in the White House. For Lawrence Luau Malong Yor Jr., Trump was a role model in his pursuit of riches and political power. Lawrence is the stepson of a former military leader in South Sudan and claimed that he made billions of dollars on his own even though most of the country's residents live in extreme poverty. Even as the nation remained involved in seemingly endless war and struggled to provide enough food for its population, Lawrence flaunted his wealth in some flashy ways. At one point, he uploaded a video to Facebook that showed him tossing around $100 bills strewn across a bed. He indicated that the total amount of cash topped $1 million dollars and described his location being at a presidential suite at an expensive hotel. However, he did not specify what city he was in. Aside from merely showing off his cash collection, Lawrence, or Young Tycoon as he calls himself, insisted that he was a generous philanthropist. He said he donated millions of dollars to organizations including the Red Cross in Kenya and South Sudan. Among the other recipients of seven-figure donations, he claimed, were churches across the region. Of course, representatives of these groups provided an entirely different story. John Mayom of the South Sudan Red Cross asserted that he knew nothing of any such donation, saying they were following up on this misleading and malicious claim. As for conspicuous consumption and shameless display of wealth, Lawrence made it clear that he didn't think it was so wrong. 
In fact, he described himself as a die-hard Trump supporter and pointed to the former president as a shiny example of someone who's not ashamed of his massive bank account. Calling his hero the world's greatest president and the world's greatest man, Lawrence said that Trump is, quote, someone who likes to show off that he's rich. In that respect, Lawrence said the two men have something in common, believing he's just like the Donald. Before exploring the scope of his daring scheme, let's look at Lawrence's background and the events that led him to a life of luxury at the expense of his suffering countrymen. As the stepson of a mighty army general with close ties to South Sudan President Salva Kiir, Lawrence was given plenty of opportunities to skim money out of the government's coffers to fund his lavish spending habits. Nevertheless, he repeatedly assured critics that his immense wealth was in no way due to his family's political connections. Instead, he attempted to portray himself as a brilliant entrepreneur who was able to amass a fortune based only on his own intelligence and hard work. That depiction of himself seemed unbelievable on its face since he had no known background in business. His behavior raised plenty of red flags, but he wasn't the first in his influential family to face severe accusations of wrongdoing. His stepfather, Paul Malong Awan, served as the military's chief of staff and allegedly used his position to carry out atrocities of all types. In addition to commanding the military to commit brutal and violent acts, the United Nations claimed that the general also forced children to fight alongside adults in the army throughout a years-long civil war. Lawrence was born in 1988, and his mother married Malong a few years later after his biological father's passing. This set the boy up for a privileged life with a nation that offered few opportunities to rise out of crippling poverty. His family moved away during his childhood, but he was considered a member of South Sudan's elite upon moving back. In addition to posing for photos with the president and other top officials, Lawrence was given the cushy government job of reaching out to foreign investors interested in launching diamond, gold, or oil excavation efforts. His position allowed him to travel around the world on the government's dime while adding expensive new items to his massive collection of luxury toys. Despite presenting himself as a billionaire tycoon, Lawrence simultaneously crafted the persona of a selfless public servant. He claimed that all of his efforts to make himself rich were also part of a plan to bring new jobs into South Sudan. While the nation sank deeper into the grips of war, Lawrence insisted that he only wanted to allow the citizens to lay down their weapons and earn an honest living. As it turns out, there wasn't much about his behavior that could be described as honest. He repeatedly denied accusations that he only got rich because of his family's connections. Instead, he said he was, quote, blessed by Jesus Christ and promised ordinary citizens they could reach the same level of success. At one point, Lawrence insisted that his family name didn't make any difference. He was a businessman, and that's all there was to it. Although he tried to paint himself as a savior for the citizens of South Sudan, his social media presence offered a different perspective. He posted Facebook pictures and videos that showed him next to private jets, luxury vehicles, and almost any other conceivable symbol of extreme wealth. Lawrence insisted that he didn't use his Facebook profile to flaunt his money and possessions when confronted with the apparent inconsistency. He didn't want to be a wealthy man, he just wanted to help his people through his Facebook. Wow, how noble. He often referred to himself using some favorite nicknames along with his staged social media posts. In addition to frequently calling himself Young Tycoon, Lawrence also posted a picture of himself flying first class and referred to himself as Smart Boy for Life. Flying business class, or coach, he argued, would negatively impact his ability to attract high-rolling investors. Flying economy wouldn't attract the people he needed to win over. Therefore, it's first class or nothing. While he was living the life of a pampered globetrotter, the people back home in South Sudan were embroiled in a disastrous military conflict and a lack of necessities, including food and clean water. A thorough investigation discovered how much climate change was impacting the people. Desert regions have grown hotter and more inhospitable in recent years, which has caused countless people to move away from the areas they called home their entire lives. The violence that has dominated much of the country throughout a period of internal strife has contributed to the displacement of even more South Sudanese individuals and families. 
The brutal civil war dates back to 2013, shortly after the country declared independence from Sudan and became the newest official nation on Earth. Before that, Sudan had been embroiled in its own violent conflict for generations. Many of the brutal practices that were common in Sudan were also upheld by the leaders of South Sudan. The regime extinguished dozens of prisoners and hundreds more were sentenced to capital punishment under the country's strict legal system. To make matters worse, the nation was secretive about how it handled executions, so there were probably some forms of capital punishment carried out without being reported. Some children were reportedly handed down extreme sentences during the nation's extended period of fear and turmoil. Hundreds of thousands of people were taken out over six years as military leaders who backed the nation's president squared off against those who sided with former Vice President Riek Makar. With adequate health care and clean water in short supply, much of the nation has grown accustomed to living in reprehensible conditions. The vicious cycle of poverty is made even worse because nearly three in four South Sudanese citizens are believed to be illiterate. Things became so bad in this troubled nation that an organization with ties to George Clooney took an interest in exposing the situation to the rest of the world. He co-founded The Century, which performed a deep analysis of what had gone wrong in South Sudan and what other countries could do to help. Following the eye-popping results of that probe, Clooney warned nations worldwide that the unrest in South Sudan could soon expand to impact other regions of the planet. He said that people should care not just because it's the right thing to do, but because at one point or another, it's something that everyone will be dealing with. The group's report determined that a corrupt network at the helm of South Sudan's government has been responsible for defrauding the struggling citizens of the nation out of what little money they had. Although Lawrence was the flashy big spender, his stepfather father was really wreaking havoc behind the scenes. Malong was the governor of the northern Bar El Ghazal region between 2008 and 2014, but when he took over as a prominent military leader, his behavior triggered some red flags. He was the top officer in the South Sudan People's Defense Forces until May 2017. During that time, he served as a personal advisor to the president and allegedly orchestrated a series of war crimes. Dating back to 2013, two militia groups carried out a slew of executions with the apparent goal of protecting the president and Malong. Reports of the atrocities captured the attention of the United States, which tried and failed to impose sanctions against the general and other high-ranking officials. As the Sentry determined in its report, Malong also collected a range of luxury possessions and extravagant residences in Uganda throughout this period. One spacious home was built within a fortress and boasted a 7,000 square foot floor plan. A second villa was about 6,000 square feet of space, built in an exclusive Bungu community. In addition, to his government salary, Malong and his close relatives maintain a financial interest in various international firms. President Kier has also courted controversy through his alarming actions and conspicuous displays of wealth. Although his salary as president was a mere $60,000 per year, investigations found that he had amassed a fortune in other countries. Furthermore, his relatives were living in luxury and escaped the brutality and poverty affecting citizens in every corner of South Sudan. Close relatives of the president were tied to scams and schemes that allowed them to profit off the civil war while bringing more uncertainty and food insecurity to the nation. Kier funded a sprawling ranch where he was free to store a range of weapons and other military gear that he bought with all his ill-gotten riches. There were even attack helicopters found at the ranch, leading to concerns that the unhinged president might turn his cache of weapons against the citizens he was supposed to be leading. While some corrupt political and military leaders can escape justice based on their financial assets and influential connections, Connections, Lawrence was finally brought to justice in 2021. He was eventually charged with a scam he perpetrated with a pair of accomplices. Prosecutors determined that the three scammers convinced a pair of foreign investors to sink their money into a fraudulent gold business in Uganda. As large sums of money moved through accounts based in multiple countries, evidence showed that the scam brought in more than $1 million. He was convicted on multiple counts, including conspiracy, obtaining money through false pretenses, and making false claims. At his sentencing, Lawrence Lawrence learned he would spend six years behind bars for his involvement in the scheme. Although it might seem as though justice was paid in this case, plenty more work must be done to reduce the corruption and crime that continues to leave the South Sudanese people living in fear and poverty. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments below what you would rather do. Get into any university you choose and pay full tuition, or try and start your own business and be given $25,000.